Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Ming Jen Lim, and I oversee the new release films in this building. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's sneak preview screening of Ramin Barani's Fahrenheit 451. Uh, we have a couple of special guests here that I will shortly introduce, but first some housekeeping notes. I would like to start by acknowledging the Mississaugas of New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Wendat, the original keepers of this land, for hosting us this evening and for hosting TIFF year round on, the, on their territory. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our public supporters, the Ontario Media Development Corporation and the Canada Council for the Arts. As a charitable organization, we would also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming and educational and community outreach initiatives possible. I would like to thank HBO Canada for providing us with this exclusive preview screening. Make sure to tell all your friends that uh, it screens, uh, Fahrenheit 451 starts screening tomorrow night on HBO Canada, May 19th at 8 p.m. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 is a timely adaptation of Ray Bradbury's classic dystopian novel in the area of Trump and social media. We are so excited that director Raman Barani has joined us tonight to introduce the film and participate in a Q&A afterwards with Norm Wilner, senior film writer at Now Magazine. Ramin's previous films, Chop Shop, Goodbye Solo, At Any Price, and 99 Homes have all played at the festival. So please join me in welcoming on, him on stage to say a few words. Hello. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I had four to Toronto and showing movies at TIFF. Um, Cameron and Jane have been big supporters of mine and, and peers as well. And uh, I, I just love showing movies here. So I, I, I confess I emailed them. I said, is there any way we can just show the movie <laughs> before it um, goes on HBO? Because I want to come back and keep my tradition alive with the festival and with Toronto. Um, also, it's very important to me because we shot the movie in Toronto. And um, yeah, and in Hamilton, um, which I came to really love Hamilton, I confess. Um, I don't know if you're laughing because you think I'm kidding, but I really liked Hamilton. And um, if I could choose to live in one, I would choose Hamilton. Don't be upset. Oh, I liked Hamilton. Um, uh, I live in Brooklyn anyway. And, um, but I had amazing um, crew the majority of whom were here in Toronto. It was, a, it was a phenomenal crew. I don't know if any of them happened to be here, but if you are, I thank you and salute you. Um, it, it, they were so good. And I ask a lot of my crew, I like them to bring ideas to the film. I like them to make the project better. And this crew, the people you have in Toronto were very artistic, hardworking, collaborative. Um, and it was amazing to work with them. And actors, the majority of the, um, Supporting cast was all cast here in Toronto, um, and in very talented people. Um, I don't have much to say. We'll talk about it in the Q and A. It's a. Uh, I thought about. I, I read the book in, in eighth or ninth grade. Um, it, it it impacts you at that age, and you think about it a lot. And you remember it, and I read it again in 2015, and started to think that there was something frightening about our current world. Um, and I thought those ideas could be readapted um, or modernized. And um, I had never adapted a book. I've never worked in this genre. It was not easy for me to do it. Um, it was very difficult. I had to change a lot of things. I didn't do it lightly. Bradbury adapted his own novel uh, at least twice, once as a play, once as a musical. He changed a lot of things. He let Clarice McClellan live. He, he changed a lot. And so I've changed a lot of things. So if they're diehard Bradbury fans like me in the room, please don't get upset. I've changed things. Um, but I tried to stay true to the themes. So search mainly for that and to see if it could connect to modern audience. Um, it was also the first time I tried to make a movie that I thought could hit a, a, a teenagers the way it hit me when I was in high school and, and hopefully also a, a broader 
an adult audience too. So it was a challenge, and, and I, I think it turned out quite good, and I like my actors very much, and we can talk more about the, the film after the screening. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, you've just seen it. Uh, now we get to talk about it. I. Well, we, you were you were saying just backstage a moment ago how um, uh, how the adaptation is uh, you're you're adapting a work that was written before our current society existed, and you have to imagine the future that would have come from us rather than from the book's future. So, where do you start? I mean, when did you know you could do it? Um, well, I can't say I ever knew I could do it. <laughs> um, I think it was in the first draft, I called my agent and said, can I give them the money back? Um, because I didn't have any understanding of how to do it. I don't know if I ever figured it out, really. It was just, um, it was very difficult because um, if I go into your homes right now and burn all your physical books, I'm sure you would be upset. And then you would just download them onto your phone. And if I smash your phone, you would shrug and just download them to another device. And I had to deal with that because otherwise I didn't see how it would be relevant to the world we live in. In fact, I talked about this with a friend of mine who's 83. He was a filmmaker. And he said, well, I could care less about this story because I read everything on a tablet. And he was 83. And in my mind, I was thinking, I have to make sure a 15, 16-year-old also could enjoy it, as I mentioned in the introduction, because that's when I got the book. So that was already frightening and um, when you when I started digging into the book it was like um, there wasn't a world much actually in the novel it's quite in Montag's head there's like four locations there's very few places that that exist and when I started to ask questions like well yeah but what about who who controls that and how yeah. there weren't there weren't answers really and I didn't know what to do um, so it w I found it very frightening the whole time. Um, and, and, but he, anyway, he, he seemed to have predicted so many different things. You know, in, in the novel, he talks about um, the firemen want to know who, who started the first fire department, and they say Ben Franklin, to burn books. And to prove it, they look in their fireman's handbook. So, you know, it would, that seemed like, okay, that could be recreated, and the Internet could tell you whatever you wanted to know, and you wouldn't know if it was real or not. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, you know, in the age of social media, just having Montag say it's a pleasure to burn as a as a catchphrase, is, um, I mean, it, it's it's a chilling moment because it completely repurposes the 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 novel, the the thrill that you get from picking up that that book, the Bradbury book, and also says that it's, I mean, the way it's expressed in the film is with such pride by someone who literally doesn't know what he's saying. Like you're, you're, you're watching indoctrination happening to other people through him. And yeah, as you say, if you control history, if you write your own version of, of the past, then the present is whatever you want it to be. But yeah. it's terrifying. Well, and also Bradbury in the novel said that the fire shows were shows and that the firemen almost weren't needed anymore. It was more for the show of it all. And he said they happened at night. So that led to putting the movie almost entirely at night because the fire looks good at night. And um, well, this is from the book. I mean, and, and it was true. The fires look more interesting at night. Um, I mean, I watched the Truffaut version, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, but fire just looks more interesting at night. And um, he said they were shows, so that led to the idea that the firemen could be stars, you know, that if they're being watched, they were entertainment in the book for people to see. Well, I, I, we don't really go to see live things now. We see them on screens, which he also predicted. So it just seemed no, natural that they would become social media stars or stars on, on screens. And they would be addressing people through the screens, which he had that in the novel in a way. He said that you could interact with screens. He predicted that too. So just it just seemed normal in today's world. That's what it would be. Yeah. We just at dinner, I said, I'm FaceTiming with my niece in North Carolina, you know. And she picks up a play phone to call me. I think that's adorable. And she's two and a half. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. The next generation will be so far ahead of us. With so, I mean, it's basically the same way watching kids play video games faster than we did 
as, as children because there's no learning curve. It's simply absorbed. But I, I love uh, dystopian universes that have been extrapolated from the present day. And, of course, the, um, the, the obvious connection to demagoguery, to, to the Trumps, to the, to the Fords here, even. You can't help but feel that part of your brain tugged on. I mean, you're in Toronto making this movie. It's got to be there. Uh, the, um, the, the, the line that, I mean, it, it really is distressingly credible, that, that line of, of uh, Beatty's. Uh, there were too many opinions, so we collapsed it down to one. Or I'm paraphrasing, but... Uh, yeah. That's actually Bradbury again. He yeah. said, why give people two sides of a question to worry about? And Jordan says, better give them one. And then Shannon says, or none. This comes out of the book. And again, it seemed like the world we live in because... Um, and, and connected to this is Bradbury's idea that we wanted things this way. And so we want to look at news, we go to our stream, an algorithm is telling us what we want to think and feel, we read the headline because it's too much bother to read the whole article, which he was also worried about. Readers digest sound bites, of course that's what we digest now. We like it, we share it, and we feel happy, and we move on. Um, and we don't even know what it is we're liking or reading. Where did it even come from, right? It, you know, could have been a, 18-year-old kid in, in, a, in his basement typing the article about Pizzagate, yeah. if well, you recall. I mean, just this morning, apparently, there was a false Facebook bio for the, for the Santa Fe shooter almost immediately, well. and almost immediately identified as false. But the speed of it is just, I mean, you guys all feel it, right? We're exhausted all the time now yeah. because there's three things a day, then there's six things a day, and then in the middle of it, there's your own life that you somehow have to navigate. And... Here in, in the world of, of the film, there is uh, a constant flow that can't be turned off, and it's hanging in your room all the time. The screens are, and I, I just I love the idea that they are actually screens, that they're screens, literal screens. Oh, yes, because it's they're so, curtains almost. Yeah, yeah, it's so weird, and it's also logical that if you're yeah. mass producing something, it's easier to just project onto a onto a piece yes. of cloth. But the the unfussed nature of it, how everyone simply accepts this authority as read, and how the the entire structure is based on not asking questions. And then in the middle of it, we have uh, Shannon barfing out these little quotes here and there that are clearly eating away at him from the inside. His, his, his ambivalence, um, there's, a, there's a, a spin he puts on a line uh, about don't make me have to come and chase you down, where he just, it's friendly. It's not, it doesn't when need to be When he says threatening. don't make me come get you. Yeah. It's actually from the book again. <laughs> and um, with Mike, because of my second film with, with Shannon, they're two Mikes, yeah. I should say their last names. This is my second film with Sh and I call them both Mike. Um, this is my second film with Shannon, and um, it was always, I don't have to direct much, the, the note with Mike Shannon was always, remember you actually love this guy, and encourage him, don't lose him, bring him back into the fold. So even in a scene like that where Jordan is trying to resign, he, he legitimately wants to try to get him back, but he's, of course, we're very concerned that he's losing him, that he's going to cross the line, that he can't bring him back. And I think he's so terribly lonely. Everyone in the movie is very lonely. They have no um, connection to anything. To me, when I would see the movie over and over again because you're editing it and trying to work on it, I very much always feel something when Clarice touches his hand, when they're touching the harmonica, because no one touches except for to beat each other up. Um, there's no, no one has any connection. And Shannon always seemed very lonely to me, the character, and he, I think, was hoping that he could get Jordan's character to hang around long enough to start feeding him scraps to read and just have somebody to talk to. Yeah. As he says in the movie, I would rather go in the, with my brother in the darkness than go alone in the light meaning he doesn't know, have the ability to free himself. Yeah. He wants someone to be with him in this trap. Yeah, he's playing the tragedy of it. And, and the other Michael, Jordan is playing a different tragedy. He's playing a personal sort of apocalypse because everything he believes is falling apart and there's nothing else but resistance except, I mean, it, it's the concept of resistance that, you know, again, the, the inhabiting of a novel in a person is straight out of the book, but it's such an alien concept now, again, because why would we need to do that? Why would anyone, I can't even memorize a, a news story, let alone can't a novel. You, no one can remember their partner's phone number. Yeah. 
we've 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 surrendered all of that already. We yeah. were we were trying to remember the name of a film that we both had seen and enjoyed. Uh, uh, it was just uh, I've been to L.A. so many times, but I don't know how to go from one place to the other without the telephone telling me how to do it. Yeah. But I live in New York. Um, well, you have the grid. Yeah. In New York. Yeah. Um, and the the alienation. I um, wanted the books to be alien. Mm -hmm. You know. I didn't want to show a physical book for a long time, you know. I, I and then when you see the books, it's almost one minute long shot around the attic to show them, and I wanted it to be like a, you know, some water in a desert that that it, you were waiting to see them, and when you see them, they just seem so foreign, and the firemen and their costume doesn't make sense next to the book; they just seem so. Um, even to me, their costume seems violent next to the books. And when he hands Jordan a book, he almost has to step back from it because it's like a very frightening thing. And I think um, the, everything about physical things in the movie seem foreign to them. The touch of the hand, the leaves that have wind. What is wind? They don't even have a comprehension of wind and leaf anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't even know how many people can remember climbing a tree or picking an apple, you know? I don't remember the last time I climbed a tree, yeah. you know, or what it even feels like. So I, I, I wanted those elements. And th the titles of the books are obviously important. And I, I was really struck by so many of them having post-dated 451. I mean, we have the, the, the acknowledged classics of literature, but then they start to be contaminated with the present in a weird way. I wouldn't say contaminated. Um, you know, the, look, the reality is, uh, I'm not saying, I'm not judging anything. I'm just saying in the novel, the books are written by um, all dead white men. Mm. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It was published in 1953. But, you know, we live in a different time. I read different books. Um, you know, I'm Iranian, so of course I have to burn Hafez and Ferdowsi, the great um, Persian epic poets. Um, and other books that I happen to love that are written by different races and cultures and gender, because that's what I read. Um, you know, I had to change certain things. I don't think, it doesn't make sense to me, and I can't look at my partner and have Clarice be 17 and um, rub a flower under Montag's chin. It doesn't make sense to me anymore. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I love the book, but it doesn't make sense to the world I live in. Yeah, now. it's a version of innocence that no longer really No, plays, and my right? girlfriend wouldn't tolerate it yeah. either. <laughs> but Montag was married in the book, and by isolating him even yeah. further, that makes more sense as well. Yeah. It, weirdly, Claire is actually older than him in this movie and has a different knowledge and understanding of the world. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah. you just had to do it. You know. And as far as burning the books, I know it's a movie. I know it's visual effects and probably no books were actually killed in the making of this film but it hurts me to watch that just as someone no as I, I wrote an article for the new york times that was published on it was in the sunday times i don't know if new york times if you saw it but no. the first sentence of my essay is i uh, no books were harmed in the making of this film will not be a disclaimer <laughs> that i can say is true because we burn books oh. yeah we had to burn real books and um you know, it was initially painful to do it, but uh, weirdly become seductive um, and trans. Well, yeah, uh, Bradbury says it's it right too. There, yeah. He writes about that. That um, if, if there's something frightening about it, you you watching the things burn. It there's something um, transfixing to see the the pages. He says the pages curl up and the black ash, and you see it. And there's something. Um, it's impossible you haven't sat at the campfire or the fireplace and stared into the fire. There's something seductive about it, which, of course, in the context of burning culture and literature, becomes frightening. Um, interestingly, the, the two things, this, a little anecdotes for you. Please. Um, he talks about the pages curling up. This happened with one book, and it was Martian Chronicles. <laughs> and it kept curling up on Bradbury's name which I don't know if you noticed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But it was the only time it just kept going Bradbury, Bradbury, <laughs> Bradbury, Bradbury, by chance. Nice. And so there is in the film. And then I watched with you the, just I wanted to hear the sound, so I waited for the opening to see, make sure the sound was okay, and I saw the amazing trailer for 
Kubrick's film, and Dave, um, Kierdulia, is actually in the movie. The actor playing Dave from 2001, he's the historian who is in that room where he's talking about journalism, um, which is, of course, another dead art form or form of anything. It's just totally gone. Yep. But that was... He killed Hal, but now he has to deal with Yuxi. <laughs> and um, Yuxi doesn't have one lens, has you know 18 lenses, because we shot all that with a um, virtual reality camera. I had amazing uh, people, Jim Ryder, my VFX guy, and also Russ, the uh, assistant camera, who was very good, Toronto local. Um, they helped me devise that, because I wanted to shoot it with a virtual reality camera, and then unspool the 360 degrees to fit a 16 by 9 frame, which creates the weird look of the fire truck that it looks like it's driving sideways somehow. And they did that for me. Um, your crew here was very good. Russ was great. I, I, in fact, I, he gave me blocking advice on a few occasions, and I took it. Um, no, I, I don't say it in a humorous way. I, if, if somebody is good at what they're doing and has good suggestions, the job of the director is to create an environment that they could feel that they could say it and then if it was good, you would take it. For example, the woman who coordinates this event, yeah. you know her, what's her name? Um, She's I here, don't, I, I don't yeah. know her name. She opened I the, I want to say Amy, it? but I'm wrong. What, Sandra. Sandra. Sorry. It's there, Sandra's standing right there. Yeah. We've been, I saw you now just a few minutes. I think she's excellent at her job and she does it with a passion, I can tell. So if I had any job in this cinema, oh, no, I would ahead. turn Please, to her. Please, a plug for yeah. She yeah. de does it with a precision, a specificity, and I sense a passion. So if I ran this cinema, I would be looking to her for suggestions to make it a better one. Yeah, we've worked together in a number of real yeah. talk screenings. And I think it's that job of the director is to get people to make your world, your life better, and to make the project better. I, mean, I would hope so, yeah. as opposed to being an autocrat and just rolling over everybody, which is a different... That works for some people, but yeah. I prefer that people make the thing better if they're smart and have good ideas. Yeah, well, and that does bring us to the Toronto aspect of it. Um, you shot it here and in Hamilton in Georgetown, I believe, uh, for location? My location manager I know is here yeah. somewhere, Sean. Yeah, <laughs> but I liked Hamilton. Don't, I know you don't like that, but... Like Apparently Hamilton. they have a really good restaurant there. French, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not ki I'm not kidding, he's, he's serious. Yeah. Um, I like him. But yeah, just the idea of setting this, this film in... Cleveland, when the, the novel doesn't really have a, a location or even a feel for where it is. Um, and then using, I thought I saw a shot of the Colony Tower or the Bank Tower, whatever it's called in LA at one point. It's, it's the, the, the American other space that isn't anything, and Toronto is really good at that, yeah. apparently, just because we have angles on everything that look like any city you want it to. But um, as far as populating the film, uh, a number of, of I, mean, I know uh, Rul uh, Benesia is here tonight. Uh, he's in the film. And there he is, okay? Yeah. And um, yeah. Graceland Kung is in there and a number of other uh, local talents who are just showing up and doing the work. Yeah. Uh, and was there a particular location or a particular day that went especially well because of how wonderful Toronto is? <laughs> well, um, it's all very, I, I, I like Toronto. I mean, the um, we did a lot of casting uh, of locations with Sean and, you know, we... The novel is set in the future. We tried to set this in a... The, the concept was alternate tomorrow, really, that I didn't need to put it in the future anymore because it's already... All those things are already basically here, and I wanted us to feel like it could be now. And so it was about finding um, locations that seemed to all fit together, and we worked with that with the, the production designer and Sean the location manager trying to find things that would all match the some photos that we liked and drawings we liked, Kudelka and, and, and some other um, photographers, Bruce Davidson I like. And um, then it was about getting things out of the frame, really. Mm. Like no people and no cars. That the, the exterior landscape to be empty for the most part because mainly people are at home watching things at home or and if they're out, they're just staring at the screen on buildings. And then the buildings, of course, were from a lot of different places, New York and other. And then the local talent, um, we had Robin Cook did the casting here. And um, I like casting. I like casting and location scouting more than making the movie, really. And um, for casting, I think you may also recall, Raul, Ra when, when someone comes in, 
if I like them, I tend to start talking to them. I kind of want to know who they are and where are they from and what are they up to, and I want them to improvise. Um, and sometimes I have them read two, three different parts. Um, and I'm, I like to change things. If the part was written for a woman, I could change it to a man. If it was for a man, to a woman. If it was for an old person, I might cast a young person or vice versa. If it's possible, I like to change things. And I like to tell the casting director, just bring the best actors you have. Forget what's written in the script. Just bring good actors, and maybe we can find a place for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we certainly we did that. I yeah, think. I think I, so. Yeah. Sorry, I'm being a little bit of a booster, but it's just it's great to see us have our moment. We were talking about this earlier, where between the shape of water and downsizing and this, there, there's this sudden sense that we can do anything. We're I suddenly so, doing yeah. all these genres. I enjoyed things. working here. I would come again for okay. sure. Yeah. But for the restaurant. No, I would come to shoot. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, I don't you. care that much about food in the end. I like working. <laughs> yeah. And you've got, I mean, as just in terms of timing, too, this is probably the best time to have Michael B. Jordan in anything because he's just gone nuclear um, in the last couple of years. And he's such a he's such an interesting choice for a leading man in a science fiction movie, if, if that isn't too weird, because he's so internal and he's so closed that watching him open is... Like that was the most interesting thing to me to watch in the film is to see him suddenly like there's a spark of intelligence behind his eyes he's understanding things and then it all falls away. Um, how much time do you have with him to before you shoot? Did you rehearse? Was there like a long process to make this movie, or are you working to a schedule? Um, well, interestingly, he he closing him down for the first half of the film I think was a challenge for him because he. Hadn't done that before, which I think excited him in a way. I think he's very expressive. His face gives a lot, which I like. Um, I went down to meet him when he was shooting Black Panther, and I had researched. I read all his interviews. I watched him on YouTube. I like to do that with the actors. I want to have a sense of who they are. Even if I, 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 you can understand that maybe there's a bit of a performance always in an interview, but still I think the real person is there, and he always seemed very intelligent, driven, ambitious, focused, and friendly, always. And that's what I was expecting to meet. And he came into the restaurant, he swaggered in, really. And he wasn't friendly. He was quite gruff and a little bit, and he had um, gold in his teeth, which I didn't, I never saw in any of the photos or interviews with him. And I had no idea what was going on. And for a few minutes, I thought this was the most awkward, this is just not the guy that I was expecting. And after a few minutes, he took the teeth out and he said, I'm sorry, man, I'm, I'm playing the villain in this new movie, and I was just, I'm stuck in my character. So actually, the Killmonger came to the first five minutes, and I was really all, kind of like, I don't know if I want to work with this guy. <laughs> and then the real Jordan came, and was so kind of what I expected, all the things I described, friendly, ambitious, smart. And um, him and Shannon came for about a week or so before shooting for costume and everything, and we... You just read the script together. So Jordan and I read the whole script over a few days and talked about that. We'd already talked many times for months in advance about the script, and I was rewriting for him, which I like to do for my actors. I like to rewrite for them and change things and have them bring things into the role. I, I, Jordan had said, it. Can we? I really want to change certain things for the way I am and the way I walk and talk. Would you, would you be open to that? And my response was, if you don't do that, I'm not sure I would want to work with you. I like that. I want that. And, um, you know, we do the script read and fix bumps in the road, and then him and Shannon did a reading together, and him and Clarice read the script together. And you're just looking for things and trying to answer questions. And... Um yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to picture sitting down and having lunch with Killmonger. It would be tense. First few minutes, I just was like, yeah, it I was... I can't get past that. Yeah. Did he have the things on the chest? That would be weird. No, he just had the, the teeth and the attitude. And um, then he came out. Because it's very hard to, for actors to come and go out of a role, especially God knows how many months he had been shooting by then. It's hard yeah. to get out of that frame of mind. No, I would think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're kind of, I'm pushing up to the edge of my time now, so I don't want to be greedy, and I'll throw this open to you guys. Uh, we actually have, for the first time, there's a microphone available to the balcony. If anybody up there has a question, just wave your arms and flap them, and I'll find you. And we will start dead center there. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, Norman, for your wonderful writing. And now, oh, quit it. No, uh, um, 
Yeah, um, this will sound critical. I've been sitting here trying to think how to ask this question, but I just have to do it. Um, in so many American movies and television shows, when anybody refers to Canada, it's like they're referring to a small generic town. Nothing is ever going to a specific place across the border, it's just to Canada. <laughs> can, can I ask why that was the case, especially in this movie where the people referring to Canada are actually some of the well-read scholars in the country house? Um. Well, I, I'm not even actually sure they know exactly where it is in Canada. It, the, they have to follow that, um, the transmission, the signal that's going to come when they turn on that device, the transponder. So I don't think they actually know exactly where it is in Canada. It's funny, I, I thought it was... I, I don't know, what, what I could tell you is uh, sometimes in America when people ask where I'm from and I say Iran, they ask me if it's in upstate New York. <laughs> and I, I realized at that point I should say yes. <laughs> you can't get there from here, that's the only thing I can think of. Uh, I thought Canada was like hope. I thought it was an expression of salvation that, that Canada will save us, which I yeah, and, and, and I believe in, in, in the movie Canada is one of the dark countries, meaning for the firemen, meaning it's a country where you could still read and have freedom of thought and expression. Yeah. So yeah, so going to Canada is or sending it to Canada is like sending it to salvation. Uh, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny that that this film and also the adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale are really aggressively doubling down on the idea that these dystopias are. American, they're mm -hmm. not the world. Um, in in the novel, we're inside Montauk's head, and we have no idea what else is out there, really. Yeah. And in the television adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale, they've been really specific about it's mostly New England, it's not even all of the U.S. But Canada, we get to be the sane ones to the north, just looking there and going, "It's a phase; it'll be fine." And <laughs> that's how that's how I prefer to to picture it. But yeah, I, I don't see it as necessarily dismissive in this case. I thought it I thought it meant something like more almost profound, almost like an, uh, an utterance of a faith of some sort. Uh, sorry, I don't see the sparkly thing, but we have, oh, here, and then we'll get up to you, if you don't mind. So I don't know if you talked about this with the cast, but I wanted to know if you could pick one book, which book would you be, and what book do you think uh, Jordan, Shannon, and Sophia would select as well? Um, <coughs> I probably shouldn't speak for them. Um, but I guess if I had to pick just, I, I, I hate the idea of picking one, but um, I, I guess if you forced me, I would pick Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, which is the great Persian epic poem um, written just after the Arab invasion, where Ferdowsi spent 30, 40 years traveling the country collecting all the, the great um, folk tales and stories and epic, po epic stories and wrote it entirely in the Persian language with, no, with not even one word of Arabic in it to preserve the language and the culture. Um, and that the thing Clary says about language is true, actually. There are, there are like one Iranian here. <laughs> um, uh, the current tenant is totally de destroying everything, um, the current tenant of the country I live in. Um, the thing Clary says about language is true, actually. There are 6,000 languages in the world today. And if you and I were to meet in 14 days from now, there would be one less, because every 14 days, a language dies. Right now, actually. And um, that's what she's getting at in that area where she says now there's only 60 left, which means thought, imagination, dreams is gonna become increasingly homogenized. This all often, in my opinion, gets cleverly put into, the, into notions of, quote, multiculturalism which I find to be sometimes a very um, obscure word. Uh, what does it actually mean? I think often it means white man. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with anything else often, but absorption into one thing. Um, so with the elimination of language anyway, you're gonna get rid of certain things. Um, here then, that, that goes one step further into the elimination of words, turning them into emojis and cartoons. And that again, uh, could lead down the road of less ability for critical thought. 
yeah, to the lighthouse gets a laugh, and then you realize, oh, that's that's actually happening. That's a hashtag game. That's Somebody's going to start. Yeah, actually, you can buy uh, emoji books now. You can buy Moby Dick emoji book and the Bible in emoji to form. This. No, you can. I know, you but can I get don't them. Want to. The, the same way other horrific things are happening, suicides that are on Facebook Live or Periscope, and you can, I don't encourage you to watch it, but I, I had to look at it. You can see emojis floating by a man who says he's about to shoot himself. Um, so these things are happening now. Yeah, it's the that sort of psychic disconnect of a screen just not being, you can do anything you want because none of it is real, and it doesn't matter that the other people on the other end are receiving. Oh, people are the worst. Um, sorry, we had someone up. I that man it. has been ha had oh. his hand up for the whole time. Yes, and we will send. Okay, Just say it. We will send the microphone to you next. But the the flashy is up in the balcony. We finally have a question from the balcony. I'm so sorry. Hey, I'm glad to be the first to ask a question from the balcony. But uh, it's important. <laughs> thank you very much for making the film. I think it's uh, very important. Um, I'm a, I'm sort of disturbed by the movie, but I'm not sure whether it's the the content or the storytelling. So I guess my question would be to you if there was sort of a political statement in there. I, I guess, or what, what do you find disturbing about it in the sense is that the homogeneity, the homogeneity of thought that was disturbing, that was happening in the McCarthyan era? Or is it the, I don't know, the, the rogue liberalness of uh, kind of an anarchist undertow? Or is, or is it sort of the ignorance of the populace? I, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of torn inside and just felt I'd leave it to you to kind of help uh, bring out what the important points were that we should take away from your movie or from your storytelling. Well, I mean, I like all the things he said, and this gentleman was giving you a thumbs up even. Um, he liked it. Um... I think all those things are valid and good. Um, I don't know if I should say, um, because if I, if you asked me and hadn't said those few things, I wouldn't have said any of those, and um, that would have prevented us from thinking about it in that way. So I, I liked all the things you said. I mean, my, my, mine is just we could read a book from cover to cover. It would be nice. Um, but I like everything you said. Thank you. Um, we have, OK. We're getting a mic to you, and we have someone up in the back corner, and then you'll be next. Hello? Ah, okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much. That was a great film. Um, my question is, in the book, Montag Steals a Bible, I'm wondering what uh, influenced you to choose Kafka's Notes from the Underground? That's Dostoevsky. Oh, Dostoevsky, sorry. Yeah, but he does read Kafka also, also in the, in the um, attic. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Taste for wretched literature. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I knew it would be a big change, but um, I don't know. I I, I confess, I, I it just was. It, you know, I had to reinterpret it in my own way, and I I um, I just um, I don't I don't know if I could connect to the character that would memorize the a religious text. It just wasn't my thing. And also, the Bible's quite big. Um, I say that seriously. Um, the Bible or War and Peace would be much harder to hide in your fireman's outfit. Um, and I really thought it should be a slender book, so I thought about Candide for a while. Um, but then I just really liked the opening lines of Notes from Underground because it seemed to match the character to say what he says when he reads it on his toilet. Um, which I always looked at Sarah Green, my producing partner, and I was like, I can't believe they've given a brown guy this much money to make a movie about a black guy reading Russian literature on a toilet. <laughs> I always thought I'd con somebody. Um, it's 2018. <laughs> uh, 2019, something yeah. else will happen. <laughs> yes, true. Hi. Hello. Uh, I was very surprised to see that you co-wrote the movie with uh, Amir Naderi, who's an Iranian filmmaker. And I and did a quick one of the masters. Right. And I did a quick Google that he also co-wrote uh, 99 Homes with you. I'm just really curious because he doesn't seem like the person who would write a dystopian sci-fi. 
thing. So I was really curious on your basically how you became to be writing partners with him, and if you can comment on your uh, creative partnership. Thank you. Well, me neither, in a way. I, even I'm still surprised I did it. Um, yeah, Amir, um, if you don't know, is Iranian started as an Iranian filmmaker and the new wave. Um, Kiarostemi's first film is based on his life and his second film was written by Amir. And then Amir's most famous Iranian film is The Runner. Maybe you've seen it. Um, Piers f certainly brought it, all the, this Piers anyway, we, we owe most of Iranian cinema and the Americas is because of Piers, I think. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and um, then he made films in America, Japan, Italy, et cetera. And I'd always loved his films and it took me a while to find him and for him to then accept a talk. Um, I hired his cinematographer, he, a guy that shot a couple of his films, shot my first three, four films, and then, um, you know, um, we talk a lot. Um, I have another writing partner who's French, Iranian. She was also part of 99 Homes and Goodbye Solo and Chop Shop. And I tend to talk a lot with them, and then I write, and then I show them, and then we talk, and then I write, and then we talk and talk. And I tend to talk a lot about it the structure, the scenes, and um, I, I like working with people that, um, as I said earlier, people that can add things, and he's just older and more knowledgeable, so I always learn something when I'm sitting with him. And is it, um, I mean, do you send drafts back and forth, or is it mostly just the collaboration of conversation? No, um, we don't exchange drafts. I, I do all the writing, but we talk, and then um, often we, we're sitting together for hours at a time and sometimes I'll write a scene and he'll do something else and then we'll, I'll show him and we'll talk about it and then we'll try to figure out the structure and how to get it to go forward. Oh. Yeah. I don't know of anyone else who, who has that kind of co-writing relationship. That's, that's fascinating. And, and to crack a text like this, too, I mean, was there any one thing that, that emerged specifically in conversation? Did you break anything through? or I mean, just the, the ominous, the idea of that, which is sort of not really floating around in the book. No, it's not in the book. I mean, I mentioned it to him, and he d ended up liking it a lot, so we kept going with it. Um, storing things in DNA is not a fantasy. That happens now. Because mm -hmm. some people, I, I realize, seem to think we made it up, but you can store information in, in DNA now. George Church in Harvard, who I went to visit, has been doing it for over a decade. Um, and um, Oh, that's... Yeah, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a subplot in Orphan Black around that revolves around an ASCII code oh. being in DNA oh, since really? the 30s, which is, th they said that was the stretch. Yeah. But present day stuff, yeah. I knew yeah. it was pulling it in my brain now. somewhere. Yeah. And, um, and Bradbury talks about the, f the phoenix as a symbol on their outfit, and then we thought about Attar's Conference of the Bird, which my three Iranian people here will know what I'm talking about, and no one else will. Um, and um, it just seemed like a way to have a real phoenix, mm -hmm. you know. And you get the the invasion of the natural world being a positive thing at the end with the yes. that one horny swallow going out to... The murmuration, yeah. yeah. A starling. Starling, my mistake, yeah. yes. The starlings have the murmuration, which is that formation they make in the end. Right. This our friend here knows about yes. it. Yes. Um, way up in the corner, and then we'll have time for one more. Hi. Um, thank you for the film and uh, the discussion. Um, I'm very interested in, like, debates over the limitations of like art and expression that are going on right now and so I was really I've been thinking about the uh, the scene where they're in the top floor of that house and um, Beatty is explaining to um, Montag that um, he's kind of giving this narrative as to ex explaining why they burn the books and uh, he says, like, Tom Sawyer, black people were ang angry about Tom Sawyer, but then white people got angry about Native Son, and then, um, you know, feminists were upset at Roth, and then at the end, you pick up Mein Kampf, and nothing is said, and so we're just left with that. So I guess I'm wondering, like, is that a, like, was that a justification, like, are you, yeah, were you presenting that as like a straw justification that is used in the book, or does that maybe reveal some of your own thoughts on like limitations on expression, or do you understand my question? Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's really from Bradbury. Um, I just changed some of the books and a few of the lines. He had Uncle Tom's Cabin, I believe. Um, and he talked about mi m millions of minorities' opinions and 
you know, um, he had other things like, uh, I think he had a, p books that are about, against smoking made smokers upset, so burn him, you know. So he, he had that, that minorities were getting offended by every little thing so that they should just start burning all these books. Um, you know, that's kind of where that came from, but of course it connects to today with everything we already know. Um, I, t I mean, I teach at Columbia University, you know, trigger words are a big deal now, and what you can and can't show in an art school is suddenly a, um, a real issue, a real uh, question that there's two sides of it that people get very excited about, what you can and can't say or show in a, in a classroom or in a conversation. Um, even at, at Columbia, there were some, you know, ultra right wing people coming, you know, quote hate speech, and there's two sides of that as well, right? Like, so it's a very tough subject. Um, I don't know, you know. I think a, a, I think seventy years of academic knowledge to tell me that. Um, someone coming and speaking against Jews is a bad thing was enough for me. I don't think I need that guy coming on my campus talking about that. Uh, so, but you can say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna censor that person, maybe, I don't know. You know, tough, very tough subjects. Um, I like that scene anyway. Shannon seems so disturbed by the Spinoza. Yeah. And, of course, he's not old enough to remember how it really went, so I just assume, again, he's delivering a, a version, a convenient version of whatever really happened. Or it's, yeah. it, it's like a... Or what's been passed down to him. Yeah, like yeah. a broken telephone version of the first thing. Well, came as Clarice him. says to him, that's what your fire captain, either he lied to you or his fire captain lied to him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even, maybe he doesn't know. Yeah, well, that's the, the thing that... He also doesn't answer when... Jordan says, why didn't the whites like Native Son? He doesn't answer that question. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, Dead Center? Mark Finn always gets banned because, you know, usually white people in the South, they don't want it there because it's a reminder of slavery. But then they say the blacks don't like it because of the N-word. Um, but I think is they don't want slavery to be around the kids anymore, right? So it's more about erasing the reminder. I think it's about erasing history, really. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. No, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I, for one, know about the book and watched the 1966 movie, and this is a total switch of what we know about the book and the movie. I noticed one thing in the making of your film. It's like everything is in the dark, all the scenes, except for the scene when he goes to the uh, eels where they are in their hideouts. It's the first scene or the only scene that we've seen, sun and daylight. Were you implying that this is where light, where hope is, and every every place where the darkness is is like this is where the hopelessness is, which is where the you know the bad things are happening? That sounds about in the right zone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that boy in the barn anyway. Uh, I saw his tape and I just liked him a lot. Daniel, he's Iranian American, which made me like him more. I confess. And um, I thought he was 13, but he was like 17. <laughs> and um, anyway, I like that part. And it's not just that Toronto looks more like America when it's dark. The locations do better. No, I, as I said, it was dark because Bradbury said the fire shows happened at night. Mm -hmm. And then I just thought it would be really good if the whole movie happened at night. And there was no understanding of changes in the day, you know. You almost can't tell one day to the next, and um, I just thought it would be a good, I thought it would have a good feeling to it of oppression and, um, you know, these dark blacks, very very pitch blacks. I thought it would just create a mood and atmosphere as you described of, and then the, 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 the sun and the wind and those leaves, I really wanted that, that he would feel so struck by that simple nature and not, he doesn't know what it is, but it's stirring something in him. That's the hope in that moment anyway. And then the next time you see light is with the bird and the murmuration. Yeah. And, the, and the hope. Yeah. Well, uh, that is our time. So please give oh, it thank up. Thank you. Ramin Marani. Thank you.
It was a pleasure. And thank you guys all for coming out. It was great to see you. We'll see you at the next one.